as I look back on it, I realized this really was the transitional play. That series really started for me, the dynasty that the 49ers became. It was at that time, I could feel the shift of momentum that, you know what, the Niners are gonna be something special for a lot of years. Faith. By definition, it's something that is felt with strong conviction without tangible evidence of its existence. Many claim to have it, but how do we attain it? It can't be held. It can't be sold. But it can be passed down. Faith is invaluable to those who feel it. How is it that this belief can unite us regardless of our differences? It's because of conviction, that feeling inside that links so many, from the far corners of the earth to the closest reaches of our neighborhoods. Faith is all around us. Faith springs from a glorious past forward to a promising future. The faith that those who not so quietly defeated rivals and redefined record books would inspire their brethren of today to reach such epic accomplishments. And all along, there are those who cheer. In their minds, they envision. In their hearts, they believe. And because of that, they are simply known as the faithful. Born in Roseville, California, Dan Buns, like many hardworking people, is a product of his environment. Before this blue collar athlete took the spotlight for one of the greatest hits in Super Bowl history, Dan Bunn's road to success was paved with adversity. A shaky upbringing and a stint at Juvenile Hall all led to Dan moving in with his high school football and basketball coach, Paul Gonzalez, who became an amazing mentor for Dan at an age when he needed guidance the most. He lived with me for a year and I saw him, you know, unreal, the things that he did to get where he got. And that's one thing that people don't realize what you have to do to get to that level playing professionally. You know, a lot of kids take it for granted. They don't realize the time and effort and who you're competing with, you know, to get there. Although Dan was still setting his compass at an early age, his true north was his older brother, Bernard. Bernard was a father figure and best friend as Dan transitioned out of high school and into college where he continued his football career at Division II UC Riverside. Danny and my relationship really blossomed when he was in high school. From there on, he came to UCR and uh, played one year there. The coaches did such a good job uh, at UCR that Long Beach State hired them. And Dan, he's like, what do I do? I'm at UCR and I really want to stay with those coaches. And I said, well, you can redshirt a year and then go to Long Beach State, which turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to him. Before you know it, he's drafted into the NFL. And we thought he was going to the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, their fullback from the year before came running up to Dan's apartment and said, Dan, I got a jersey for you from Kansas City with his name on the back and the phone rang just then. And uh, he was a Long Beach State 49er at the time. And the guy on the end of their end said, uh, Dan, congratulations, you're still a 49er. And we went insane. And they go, uh, Dan Bonds, what, what is your goal for the 49ers? What are you gonna do, you know, your first round draft pick? I said, well, I'm gonna even work out harder than I have been and run really hard and I'll come into camp early just so I make sure I make the team. And they all started laughing at me and I was like, what? My brother said, you know, he kind of knew, hey, you're supposed to, you know, be a little cocky. And I uh, said, I never, ever since I got cut from my first Pop Warner team, the Roseville Bobcats, and everybody made fun of me, and the next year I barely made it, I just always felt that was imperative to come into camp in great shape. So he was drafted in the first round. We grew up loving the 49ers. It was like uh, Christmas in the middle of spring. Although it was like a holiday celebration for the Buns family, the team itself, was caught in a deep freeze. Back-to-back 2-14 -back seasons made life difficult for a young player trying to find his way in the league. Well, he definitely got to see it, you know, from both ends of the spectrum. They were the worst team in the league his first two years. They were 2-14. and 14. He got in a lot of bar fights defending the honor of um, 
you know, his teammates, the coaches, Eddie D. I used to get in a lot of trouble because those first couple years were losing and people were bad mouth and I, I didn't like it. And I got in a couple little skirmishes here and there, but I wasn't going to let anybody talk bad about the 49ers because 2-14 and 14 or not, we still had a lot of great guys and it was a great team and, and I was proud. Yeah, he was very, um, you know, protective and he really stood up for his guys. I don't think he ever imagined in those early years that they would have turned into the dynasty that they turned into, but uh, that's not why he was there. I think he was there just because he always loved football and everything that went with it. You know, our first couple years were terrible and I took it pretty hard, but it, it was a very tough two years. Then we got Bill Walsh. That's where we could start to see a change, at least on my side of the ball. Offense, you could tell, because we had to go against them every day. And they were doing a lot of things that were very unique. And as a player, especially a middle linebacker, when you start going against an offense that is challenging you to really think and do things and change and, and adjust, you're going, man, this is pretty good. When we came here, Dan had a lot of notoriety being uh, a high draft pick by the group ahead of us. It took a little while for us to get him in a position that he was really comfortable at, but he was a great guy and very bright. You could put him anywhere you wanted to, really. You loved his attitude. He came to work every day. He was a lunch pail guy, and I, I love him. When Joe came, it was nice just to see him because you line up against a lot of quarterbacks. Some of them, you know, when they're down, they're stressing, where Joe was kind of, <laughs> all right, we got to get two touchdowns. Let's, let's, you know, we got four minutes. Let's, let's figure a way to do this. It was kind of like, not, oh, God, you know, it's like, this is what I'm here for. So I could see a definite change in our offense, and I could feel the defense when we drafted all those defensive backs. The draft class of 1981, which included Ronnie Lott, Eric Wright, and Carlton Williamson, was rounded out with 25-year-old leader safety Dwight Hicks, which meant that the linebacker position was immediately strengthened by a ball-hawking, hit-sticking, dependable secondary. Instead of getting 18 yards, I only had to get 10 yards. It was like, God, a blessing. And then you turn around and you're seeing guy, receivers getting lit up, you know? It's not like, I gotta run down and catch him now. They're getting held up or smashed and I could just get to come in and clean it up a little bit. So it was great. Buns and the 49ers were headed in the right direction as the 1981 season saw San Francisco racking up wins, a stark contrast to seasons past. The team played with poise, confidence, and had a very different style. Speaking of style, Dan also had a different style, one that got him noticed. You know, I always liked that blonde hair, that little curl coming out from under the, the helmet. And it's funny because now I don't really like seeing long hair coming out of the helmets, but back in, that was in the 70s, you know, everybody had long hair. He was kind of had like the hippie cowboy thing going on, you know. He, he had the long blonde hair, but then he always used to rock cowboy boots is what I hear. So he was kind of a loose cannon hippie cowboy that just rolled around and hit people. So it sounds like a, a good time. When we returned to the faithful, a series of downs that defined a team and a stop that ranks among the greatest in NFL history. In 1981, the San Francisco 49ers were on a meteoric rise. Three years into his head coaching stint, Bill Walsh had resurrected a franchise that had lived through the equivalent of football's dark ages and were primed to make their mark in NFL history. I was there at the very worst team in the league, the very best team in the league, and I got to show that yeah, we, we had some game, and, and we, that group of guys was a, a collection of guys that were just were tired of losing, and they just wanted to win, and that was the whole mantra was, we're going back to the win. We're not going back to the play the Super We're going back to win. We're not leaving unless we win. Some of the biggest names in team history weren't names at all, but that was about to change as the 49ers were headed into the Pontiac Silverdome to face off against the Cincinnati Bengals as both teams were in uncharted territory in their first Super Bowl appearance. 
they had a better team. If you looked on paper, veteran-wise and people that been around the league longer and, you know, Joe Montana wasn't Joe Montana. Who was Joe Montana? He's some skinny guy, looked like Barry Manilow. The defensive backs were all rookies. They had no idea what's going on. They were just guys that knew how to win. And there was just this fire, this chemistry. It was just a great group of guys that actually hung out together and did a lot of things together and cared about each other. You are looking live at the Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan, where the San Francisco 49ers and Cincinnati Bengals are getting ready for Super Bowl 16. This is an event, of course, that has come to the frigid northern climes for the first time ever. And how is the weather outside this beautiful arena? This weather sucks. Freezing, that's a... The wind chill factor is down to a minus 22. We were sitting on the second level on the 40-yard line, and I was feeling really good about the game. In fact, we had talked a little bit two nights before about, you know, you're in the Super Bowl. This is the dream of dreams. I just have a feeling, and he said too, he goes, I, I have a feeling that we're going to do something really great. He didn't say I, he said we. They're driving down and they have the momentum and it looks like they're taking over and we're there and we're down to the goal line and it's, let's not break. It's, ben, we can't break, let's, let's do this. And, and actually the first down play, Choma trips the running back and I finally get a good hit. He's a big man, I don't think I might have stopped him. Choma hadn't slowed him down a little bit. Second down play was off tackle on the other side and I get into the lead blocker and slam him good. Hack hits and bounces off and Craig Pookie comes in from the side and it's Lawrence Pillars and them closing in and we stop them there on the other off tackle and then the third down play comes and I'm lining up just a hair deep normal and I'm a little nervous and I, I see the back is wider so I start to step outside and I see him glancing outside and I saw this play in practice in belly ring my roommate ran it and I actually jumped up to intercept it and tipped it and it spun over my head and it landed on belly's belly in the end zone so in other words he scored so as I'm, the play starts, I'm thinking, it's that play in the flat. And they hike the ball, and there he goes. And I hesitate just for a second. I'm like, oh, my God. And I run, and I'm thinking, get the ball, get the ball. And I'm thinking, no, you got to hit him, you know? And at the last minute, he's right there at the six-inch line. I hit, and being a rugby player, I try to pick him up and try to put him down because, you know, he has momentum. But he's turning, so that gives me an edge. We make the stop, and everybody's ecstatic. And I'm thinking to myself, we're on a six inch line, they got one more down. That play means crap. To me, I'm thinking, holy moly. Now they're on the six inch line. So they call timeout, I go to the sideline, tell everybody to get low, I line up, and I'm looking, and Charles Alexander, because I just hit him, he's rock forward. I mean, he's giving me the look of death, and I'm thinking, lead, he's coming for me. And I start yelling to hack, lead, 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 and if you watch the film, we all converge at the same time. And I hit head to head, my chin strap breaks, the helmet comes down, splits my nose. I see a little blink, I'm, I'm like delirious a little bit. And I'm laying there and I'm thinking, I got across the line and I don't know if we stopped them. And I look down and I see the goal line down near my waist and I start to roll over to look up and I see Archie Reese doing this and I see Ronnie Lott jump up in the air. So I'm thinking, oh God, we stopped him. And then I get up and I'm walking in and Archie's going, you okay, you okay? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, where are you? And I'm thinking, where the hell am I? So we go off the sideline. I'm standing next to Archie, you know, and they have the TV timeout. Detroit. Detroit. And he goes, what? He goes, you got Tourette's or something? I said, no, man. I just realized I'm in Detroit. The rest was history. And then it just got its own name to stop. And actually, a couple young players said, I wish I had a play named after me. I said, yeah, that is pretty cool. <laughs> that hit should be taught to every defensive player ever. And Dan Bonds, the way he talks about that hit now, he said it was so pure. It was like the baseball player who hits the ball in the sweet spot. You know, they don't feel anything. It was that kind of hit for Dan Bonds. The fundamentals of that hit was all textbook. It wasn't just that he was the biggest guy, that he was the most prepared guy for that moment and that, that place in history. And he leveled him. And I almost jumped off the second level of the stadium. I almost went down to the first level. I was so excited about it. He made one of the greatest hits of all time, you know? To this day, that's one thing that Dan Bruns is known for. And if Alexander falls forward, they score. He didn't fall forward. Danny stopped them right 
where he caught the ball. Just as the catch, Dwight Clark went up and, and caught that ball. Nine times out of 10, he doesn't catch it. But that day he caught it, which makes it the catch. Well, that day, Danny Buns hit Alexander, and nine times out of 10, Alexander falls forward and scores, but that day he did not because Danny Buns hit it and stopped him a yard short of the goal. And it's called the stop. The part to me that really blows me away is that it wasn't just that one play, that was the great individual play, but it was, he was involved on all four plays. All four of those goal line plays, he was right in there. So that to me is the impressive part. It wasn't just the one off, it was the whole thing. It just shows how relentless, how dedicated he was to do that. He doesn't do that and they don't go on. I still, to this day, every once in a while, will just watch the stop just because. Every time I watch it, I get so pumped. <laughs> knowing him and knowing how hard of a worker he is, I know how much time and effort and how much passion he had for the game that he put into that. He always is just kind of right place at the right time and knowing and having that instinct and like visualizing and seeing it happening, that he just did it without having to think about it. Which is fantastic, but there's a lot more that goes into it too and I'm, Super proud of him. Dan Buns played for the 49ers from 1978 to 1984 and eventually finished his career with the Lions in Detroit. Ironically, the very place where he is best remembered for the stop the game-saving tackle that was part of a miraculous goal line stand that ushered in the first world championship for the 49ers. Buns was a hard-working blue-collar player who earned everything he received. He was the type of guy that loved the game more than life itself almost. He uh, loved getting out there and hitting people. He loved being focused on what he had to do, his job. It was something that just made him very intense. I just thought, this guy, he's gonna be great. In my eyes, he always has been. To this day, I have people say, oh, your dad was such a savage on the field, and man, he's tough, and he's a big guy. But really, when it comes down to it, he's such a teddy bear. <laughs> he's really sweet and um, loved having daughters, and that's very apparent in the way that he raised us. The San Francisco 49ers boasted some of the toughest defenders ever to play the game. Names like Leo the Lion, Hacksaw Reynolds, and Charles Haley come to mind when thinking of that beastly group. But there are also others, like Dan Buns, that are notable tough guys. Buns, a native Californian, was part of a defense that garnered two Lombardi trophies once hit Walter Payton so hard that he had to get up to see who could lay such a wallop. Munns even knocked out Hollywood leading man Nick Nolte in the film North Dallas 40 that hit the big screens in 1979. Yeah, there's your man. Yeah, all right. Nice catch. Yeah. So where does a guy go after a stellar career in San Francisco? That simple. To a lavender farm in Lincoln, California. We farm organically, and so we don't use any pesticides or herbicides, so that means pulling weeds by hand. He has become a maniac about weeds, which is, it kills me, because he leaves his socks all over the bedroom floor, but he can't stand to see a weed in the lavender field. <laughs> the lavender farm is awesome. I kind of wish my parents had started it sooner, but it has been great growing up out here. We really enjoyed the kind of farm lifestyle and just being outdoors a lot. Every spare minute is spent on the lavender farm. We just really enjoy making this place a beautiful place to be and sharing it with lavender customers who come to the shop and come to the field. And it's hard work, but it's very enjoyable. And when Dan Buns isn't tending to the fields to produce lavender for his farm, he is cultivating another resource. That is the minds of the children at Sutter Middle School where these days the 49er legend is a teacher and mentor. I've been there 20 years, and right now I'm teaching special ed and PE, and I love it. The kids keep me young. 
loves the kids, loves the special ed kids. They have a special place in his heart. In his playing days, I said he was tenacious and never gave up. The same thing is transferred over into his personal life. I mean, if he's going to do something, he's going to do it and be great at it. And that's what he's done. I mean, he's an awesome teacher. His kids love him. As years go by and new ventures emerge, he tackles them with full gusto and he ends up doing really well. Like most great stories, this one seemingly ends where it began. A young faith facing adversity and finding a mentor to guide him through the trials and tribulations. The incredible fortune of not only being drafted by the team you love, but working to make that team a two-time world champion while contributing all you have in the process. Finally, paying forward your great fortune by guiding and mentoring those most in need. That is the life of Dan Buns. He is known for the stop, but it was this faithful's drive that makes him truly memorable. Here's Montana throwing toward the end zone, caught on the run by Cooper. He's got it. He's in the end zone. A 49 touchdown. But I couldn't go to sleep. I was drinking some champagne. I got a little carried away, but uh, I was knocking on doors to players like, you're asleep? Are you kidding me? We just won the Super Bowl. Why are you going to bed? The guys were getting me buns. We're flying out in two hours. I said, I don't care. Get up, man. Come on, let's celebrate. Being a hit kid from Roseville, loading trucks, getting cut from your first Pop Warner team to be in a Super Bowl is just unbelievable. <laughs>